So you, people may have seen stories about healthcare workers in New York City uh, being told they had to be vaccinated if they fell into certain categories, direct patient care. The argument being, you're delivering health care directly to the public. We don't want you spreading illness and we want to protect you in the process. People got very upset that they were being told they had to be vaccinated. And I, the best quote I heard about that was somebody saying, we don't give people the option of putting on gloves when they operate. It's to protect the patient and to protect the individual. And we don't give people the option around that question. So why should we treat vaccination for flu any differently? Uh, I think there's a a, a debate worth having about whether vaccine is like that, like wearing gloves when you operate, or whether it's something that ought to be optional and up to the individual to choose for themselves. The problem is if we don't have enough people accepting vaccination, we don't get what's called herd immunity to protect the, the public. So when can individual rights be trumped by public health is a really core question that we have to deal with when we talk about the ethics of, of public health practice. And this is just another example of that question. The last time there was a very virulent flu was 1918, a global pandemic. Uh, and of course, we know much more now about how diseases spread than we did in 1918. We have many more tools to bring to bear than we did in 1918. Um, but what we don't want is for people to spread disease willy-nilly, which is what happened in 1918, not because they were bad citizens, but because they didn't really understand what the, the impact was. Th the truth is, we may have more tools now, but we also have the ability to travel in ways we never did in 1918. So a global pandemic will, will happen pretty quickly just because the borders are porous. We want them to be. People can get on an airplane and be any other point in the world within 10 or 12 hours. So we want to make sure people understand what, what's uh, at stake. We, we don't want governor, governments to behave in ways that won't be effective and close their borders, say, or, or quarantine people when that isn't necessary, when they arrive and maybe running a, a fever or something. So we want to make sure people don't overreact, but that we have a full understanding of what it will take to, to stem the, um, the spread of disease. We don't want kids going to school when they're sick. And, and one of the problems that people have understood in looking back at the spring outbreak of H1N1 was that in places where families had no other option for childcare but to send their children to school because the parents both worked in jobs that wouldn't allow them to take a day off or stay home and work, that those, those areas had much higher rates of infection because the children went to school whether or not they were sick because the parents had very little option. So figuring out ways even within communities to help people who have to go to work make sure that their kids can stay home when they're sick. So what does that mean? Maybe that means just making sure that you, you tell your neighbor, look, I, I'm going to drop in on your child a few times during the day. I don't have to stay there. They don't have to come to my house but they're old enough to sit and watch TV, and I'll just check in on them every few hours. And that allows the parents to, to do the right thing, keep their kids home from school, and break that spread of infection. So what we really want is to make sure that um, when disease hits, that we minimize the impact on our communities. I think part of the problem is we don't actually know when we're so sick that we should stay home versus it's just a regular old cold. Of course, you don't want to spread that either but the stakes are somewhat higher if we're talking about uh, an influenza that, that the population has never seen before. There's no immunity. So I think we're frankly sending mixed messages. You know, stay home if you have H1N1, but we're not going to tell you that you do or don't. It's kind of hard for people to know how to react. Um, I think we're a little bit lucky so far in that the, the illness has not been that severe. You know, there are a lot of people are getting sick, but it's, it's not killing people at extremely high rates, although the people who are dying are young. Uh, I think a big part of the story, and it's, no one could have done anything different about it, is that the amount of vaccine available has not been what people had predicted, what the government had predicted, in spite of their best efforts to estimate that. Uh, and it isn't their fault. But w what happens is people s don't trust what they're hearing from the government when they've been told, well, there'll be 60 million doses available by uh, late October. Well now, how many, we don't have 60 million doses and it's not because the government was lying, it's because the process is taking longer and the virus isn't growing as well and it's, it's a, there's a lot of explanations, but people then don't know the next time the government says do this or this is the, the case, whether it's true or not. And so uh, I think there's a kind of credibility gap that the public health community is quite worried about when it comes to 
large national outbreaks or international outbreaks. One of the most difficult problems will be if there are people who need intensive care. They need to be on uh, ventilators to breathe, to support them until they recover. We don't have lots of extra machines like that. So how do we decide who, who gets to stay on and who doesn't? Well, we might have somebody who's not likely ever to recover. They're so sick. But we have a child who needs ventilator support to survive what will be a relatively short-term um, bout with the flu. So we've been working very closely with them to help set priorities and policies and working with the public so that they understand how, to, how we're thinking this through as a community. And that's one of the, the roles and the areas where the university can really help because we have the interdisciplinary expertise to bring to bear. Uh, we, can, we can work with people in public health, in ethics, in medicine, and help the state come to grips with what we, we hope will never happen, but let's be prepared for the, the time it does. Thank you.